Well, of course, the campaign is the best person to answer that because that five sector was done during his time. <laughs> so he's blaming you. He's blaming you. I'm Wong Xiaoning and this is The Breakfast Grill. Last Friday, the first full budget with the theme Economic Reform Empowering People of this Unity Government was tabled with a clearer picture of really what the Madani economy is and how its goals would be achieved. But how does the new industrial master plan tie in with Budget 2024? And will it be able to reinvigorate growth so that Malaysia becomes this high-income nation? To answer that question and more is our panel, consisting of the Minister and also previous Deputy Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, Tunku Dato Zafro Aziz and On Ken Ming both join us this morning and we are doing things slightly differently because I'm not going to be the only one asking <laughs> the tough questions. Ken Ming is also going to do his fair share. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this morning, gentlemen. Tunku Zafro, I have to start with you. Mm-hmm. Consensus was that Budget 2024 kept to its theme and an observation was that there was, at least on paper, less goodies for the rakyat. Maybe because elections <laughs> aren't due for a few years. But is this a signal that we really needed to get our house in order, grow up and be fiscally responsible? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me uh, here this morning. And Kaming, I hope you'll be kind to me. <laughs> um, I, yes, I think the budget, if you look at it uh, in that totality, um, it is a more fiscal responsibility uh, budget, but yet it is an expansionary one, right? Um, you know, you talk about sustainability, talks about inclusivity. Uh, so we want a growth that is sustainable and inclusive, but at the same time, responsible when it comes to our fiscal uh, policy. Mm. Uh, if we look at the budget deficit, uh, this year is expected to be 5%, and next year going down to 4.3%. Uh, uh, and the Prime Minister also mentioned in his budget speech about the uh, importance of having a more targeted subsidy approach, um, especially uh, the T20 or T10, uh, depending on what uh, subsidies are we talking about. Uh, but at the same time, um, we are looking at uh, growth areas. Uh, that's where, I guess, uh, the Industrial Master Policy, the NETR, various initiative that was announced the last couple of months uh, come into play. Uh, so to me, um, the budget is a move, is a move in the right direction. Mm. Uh, you know the challenges that the global uh, economies uh, are facing today, um, the geopolitics, etc. Et uh, and you've seen that from the revision of the GDP forecast as well, right, uh, to you know, around 4% this year or slightly below that. Uh, and next year, I think we are more optimistic. Uh, GDP growth is targeted to be around 4 to 5%, hopefully at the high end of the 4%. Uh, and therefore, uh, to me, um, the budget has covered many uh, key areas, uh, but it lays the foundation for the economy Madani concept. Uh, we want to be, uh, in the next uh, 10 years, an economy which is a top 20 in, in yeah. globally, you know, in terms of competitiveness, etc. But really, we make we need to make some tough decisions as well. Right? Okay. Mm. So, Ken do you think those tough decisions were made? I mean, what was your observation of Budget 2024? Did it strike the right balance or actually was it a missed opportunity for even more fiscal and economic reform? Yeah, good morning, Chanin. Good morning, Zafro. Uh, I think that I was a little bit disappointed by the fact that there were no substantive announcements made on the rationalization of the petrol subsidy, especially mm. since we know the conditions in the Middle East are getting very tenuous and all prices may easily spike up below uh, above uh, 100 US dollars. But at the same time, I was also encouraged by the fact that there, w- there were announcements in terms of a phase uh, reduction of the uh, diesel subsidies where there are a lot of leakages. Uh, there's going, going to be uh, no, no more subsidies for chicken and eggs, uh, control price only during festive seasons, and mm-hmm. also uh, the reduction of the electricity subsidy. So I think you know, it strikes the right balance, but mm. probably more could have been done. Okay. And Tukul Zafro, let's look at some of the initiatives announced in the budget that are specific to MITI okay. and also the new industrial master plan. I want to talk about electric vehicles, you know. That's mm. your favourite new pet topic. <laughs> uh, so, of course, lots to encourage adoption, lots of personal goodies. We had extension of until 2027, the individual income tax relief of up to 2500 on expenses and a whole lot of other things. But you've also said that EV ownership is going to be available to all income groups through targeted subsidies and financial assistance. But for me, unless the prices of EVs come down significantly, mm. how will that happen? Because the cheapest EV, I did a bit of digging, mm-hmm. is just slightly less than 100000 out of reach of many. Yep, yep. Yes, I think we need to democratize uh, EV, right? Uh, in mm. the sense that, um, you know, it's now it's more focused uh, in 
the higher bracket, income bracket group. And you're absolutely right. And this is where I think the right AV policy has to come into play. Um, and But it also importantly is the spillover uh, that it has in, to the Malaysian uh, companies, the Malaysian economy, uh, to Malaysian household income. Uh, that's the big picture. But so in the budget, there was a good announcement, I think. Uh, I feel that, uh, you know, it was an idea by by a couple of industry players and NIDA, yes. METI as well, where uh, for those uh, household income about 120,000 and below, we'll get around 2,400 it for the two wheelers for the motorcycles mm. right uh, that I think will, will help uh, spur right? of course uh, we want to make sure that like I said talking about positive spillover it has to be motorcycles that are made in Malaysia I mean CKD mm. um, uh, and we hope that more uh, industry players will come uh, into uh, this space um, we're talking about battery swapping etc okay. uh, but it is a big ecosystem, right? When yes. you talk about EV, people always say, oh, uh, it's about just selling motorcycles, selling cars. But it's actually, you have to look at the whole ecosystem, the whole supply chain of EV. Uh, EV to me is like a, a phone on four wheels, right? <laughs> so um, there are many uh, components that are actually from our e and sector, which has been, uh, you know, a, a, one of our competitive advantage uh, as a nation uh, in this in, in this space. Okay. I understand that many of the E and E players are already supplying to some of the uh, major EV players around the world as well. Yes, yes. Uh, that's that's why I think uh, it's important that we look at EV in to- Hol- totality, holistically. Yeah, holistically, yes. But I want to some clarification to Kusafru. Mm. Does the government prohibit the importation of EVs that are priced below a hundred? thousand yes. because they're CBUs. Why is that yeah, the case? Yeah. Why don't we just liberalize the sector and do away with this so that yeah. you know we can get these EVs which are priced like we see overseas, yeah, yeah. 50, 60,000 ringgit, similar to what our national car price range is like. So right, there, it's not just for the cars but also for the motorcycles uh, mm. for now, right? Uh, yes. The reason is because uh, we need to ensure, like I said, there's a spillover. Why do we attract FDI? So one of the key reasons why we want to attract FDI uh, is not just about investment coming in but the positive spillover that he it has on the economy. So for CBU, it's totally important. There's no multiplier, right? Uh, so for CKD, um, we are then allowing our local suppliers to be involved, uh, local manufacturers uh, who supplies to these uh, companies. Uh, but having said that, um, mm. many uh, of the big companies that are here today did enjoy um, a number of uh, ex- waivers uh, in terms of... Yes, government. Tesla being the famous yes. one. No, um, I'm talking about um, uh, what do you call it, motorcycles okay. and cars. Okay, but the Tesla, CKD players, CKD players, CKD players, CKD players okay, because they are they are different. Because again, I can't tell too much uh, details because we have uh, an understanding with many of the big uh, industry players here, mm. um, because it's a very competitive industry. Uh, like I said, because but you need to look at EV out of the automotive space, right? ICE is different from from EV. Um, so to me, um, we are always open. Um, in fact, I think um, we are looking at this uh, closely. Mm. Uh, we want to make sure that um, local players don't take advantage of this ruling as well, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we, they need because to we protect, up. in a way, yeah. our, our auto industry is somewhat protected, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, but that's why so, I think this is uh, EV slightly different. So we are, li- if you can see the, uh, the approach is different. We're liberalizing many uh, things on, on the EV side, uh, not just in terms of incentive, but also I think going forward, uh, you have a point there, uh, to be honest. Uh, yeah. But we need to look at it uh, closely. We are studying that. Of course, I'm in favour, uh, but I know uh, I need to hear out the industry's concerns as well. There are some valid concerns. To, um, but so, in the long term, I think we should be more open about it. Okay, right? but Quinn Ming, do you think it's time to do away with all this? APs and just liberalize the sector. Yeah, I mean, just, in a way, would they encourage the Chinese EV companies to set up shop assembly shops here? Not just mm. Geely, but even like BYD. Yeah, actually, for the AP sector, many people don't realize that it's actually a very small proportion of the market, 5 to 10% at most. Yeah, and right, if, right. let's say, we do have greater adoption of EVs uh, and the APs in this sector, uh, as what uh, Zafro mm. said, more liberalized, then over time, the percentage of APs associated with uh, these imports will grow to even lower, maybe even below 5%. Okay. Uh, Tunku Zafro, I want to talk about the NIMP in, in general, right? When I look mm. at it, it's got some really lofty targets. You've got like, you want to be a top 30 largest economy, top 12 global competitiveness, top 25 mm. on human development index. Mm. But that's the economy, my darling. Yeah, no, 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 no. Not the NIMP, yes. So, but you know, <laughs> part of the NIMP, yes. and, you know, and it's all very... You know, it's got also kind of some of these old school policy driven within the NIMP. Mm. So you've got the four key missions, right? You've got mm. fa- four enablers, you've got 21 strategies and 62 mm. action plans. There's 180 pages in the NIMP. Mm. Some would say, 
it's overly complicated and mm. technical. And some even economists argue that we should just focus on liberalization mm. instead and let it be market driven. What do you yeah. say about this? Well, first of all, I have to disagree with you that it's mm. the same old policies. Uh, it is a very a major departure from the way uh, policies are uh, formulated in Malaysia. Um, you should be sector based. This is the first uh, policy that is a mission based uh, policy. Um, you know, we have four missions. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to ensure that we want to increase economic complexity. Secondly, we want to ensure that uh, industries do tech up, you know, yeah. and thirdly, we talked about uh, sustainability. Uh, I mean, of course, we know that Malaysia has a target of net zero by 2050. And fourthly, it's about governance, about inclusivity. So um, I think there's, some, there's, there's no talk about all oh, this sector, that sector. No, it's about mission-based. Uh, it has been done in, in other major developed countries before, but for Malaysia, that's the first time, mm. right? Uh, so when you look at policies, I think what's important is the outcome. Uh, yes. To me, uh, so again, as a departure where we have a delivery office uh, where we look. Uh, uh, and the, this will uh, be scrutinised. This will be scrutinised. There is a, a, a committee uh, at the management level, a committee at the uh, cabinet level, in fact, uh, chaired by the Prime Minister himself, uh, that will make this uh, execution uh, outcome based uh, an IMP is key, right? Okay. Um, so to me, uh, we are also very transparent uh, in what the outcome will be. So therefore, uh, I have already uh, decided uh, together with the committee that we make uh, the progress of an IMP transparent to all. There will be right? a dashboard, right? There will be a dashboard. Um, is it available to the public to, yes, to, uh, to look to, at to and monitor? It, yes. Uh, I don't know whether you remember in MOF as well, we had a dashboard every month. We announced mm. to, uh, to, to the media and to the public where we are. This uh, is the Laksana, Laksana program. Report, yeah. Yeah. But... <laughs> It works both ways. Like, because once you, <laughs> if you don't f meet some of the targeted timeline, uh, you have to answer, which is good to me. Because yeah, it it's puts all about pressure. accountability, yes, yes. right? Because NIMP is not about a policy that is only media is accountable to. It's uh, multiple it, agencies, it's multi multiple agencies. So that's why when you see the committees, uh, it's, you know, it is, it has not, it's not just a whole of uh, government approach, but also the whole of nation approach. It, many other stakeholders outside uh, the government are also involved uh, in this. Uh, yeah. So we only got a window of seven years. It is an uh, IMP 2030. Uh, you said, yes, the outcome is important. Uh, I think the key, if I can summarize the three key major outcomes that we want to see, uh, one is on the GDP growth. Yes. Uh, we want to see the contribution. Today, the contribution of manufacturing sector to GDP is around 24 to 25%. We want that to increase further. And in that seven years, we want the increase to be around 60% mm. growth in that area. Uh, secondly, we want to see employment. Uh, yeah. um, 3.3 million jobs. 3.3 million jobs. And Good the, jobs. Mm. And uh, the fourth, 1,510 yes, million that is wage, thing, right? Yeah, That's that the challenge. And, and for yeah. your information, do you know that the median wage of uh, the manufacturing sector today is below the average median wage, right? Yeah. Today is around 2208 of every median wage for, for Malaysians, but uh, for this sector, it's below 2,000. So right? in the mm. minute that we have mm. left, Ken Ming, what, would you, what was missing in the NIMP for you? Mm, probably we need to look at more of the details of the funding. And yes, I'm glad yes. that that has been announced in the budget. Correct, yeah, correct. although the uh, sum yeah. does look quite small. We'll come back yeah, to that. That's for the first year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we were talking about funding, and this brings me to the perfect point because at the budget 2024, you got some, but <laughs> overall, NIMP allocation of $94.6 over seven years. Now, pay, on paper, it looks great. But if I look at it in detail, it's really just about thirteen and a half billion a year, or zero point seven by seven, seven and a half percent of GDP. Look at some of the granddaddy of industrial master plans: the U.S. Chip Act, two hundred eighty billion U.S. dollars, fifty three mm. billion in subsidies, mm. and then twenty four billion in tax credits. To go Zafro, can NIMP really move the needle when yeah. the sums are small in comparison? Yes. Well, first of all, you did talk about percentages, yes. uh, so please bear in mind what's the chips X. Uh, percentage over the US GDP. Uh, I think it's less than ours. But anyway, uh, what's important uh, is actually on the execution side. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm thankful that we had the, you know, our request for the first initial 200 million for next year has been granted, has been approved. Uh, but also bear, bear in mind that number that you mentioned, uh, we've always budgeted around 9 billion from fiscal, uh, from government support, and the rest is from the private sector, uh, both uh, uh, lending from the financial institution and the tapping into the capital markets. Mm. Uh, but it is important, I completely agree with you, uh, that we need more support uh, going forward. So I hope that this support continues uh, uh, from, from government, uh, from my ex-colleagues and Ministry of Finance. Uh, because um, 
financing is one of the key enablers yes. uh, towards any plans, uh, actually. Um, and competition is stiff. Uh, Malaysia is in a position where there is a window uh, of opportunity here uh, as what's happening in, in, in China, in US. Mm-hmm. There have been uh, realignment of the supply chain. People are looking at supply chain resiliency. And Malaysia, uh, as part of ASEAN, actually, has been a net beneficiary uh, of this. Uh, if you look at FDI globally, it is going down uh, in the year of 2022. Two last year, based on UMTAT numbers, uh, international numbers, uh, FDI globally has gone down by 12%. But ASEAN bucked the trend and is mm. up by 5%. And I think there's a reason uh, for this, uh, reshoring, French shoring, whatever shoring you want to call it. Uh, but we must uh, be in the position. So I think NIMP is... Uh, at the right time uh, so we use this uh, policy to attract uh, investors as well to come in and you did mention local investors also important yeah. right yes um, and when we talk about investors uh, we have also realigned our mandate to include FD- DDI into mm. uh, that equation and in the first six months I think uh, our investments uh, has come up to a total of 132.6 billion ringgit of which nearly half is actually from domestic uh, and we've seen this uh, recently increase and okay. I think that's uh, important as well I'll come mm. back to DDI DDI, but mm. I think, uh, you know, Kemeng and I b- both want to know this 200 million in funding that mm. you got from the budget. Mm-mm. How are those funds going to be allocated? You know, what's what's the priority? How is it going to be spent? Yeah, I, I think uh, people will probably want to know the industrial, NIMP Industrial Development Fund and also the NIMP Strategic Co-Investment Fund. I yeah. Think. Yes, yes. So I think, the, uh, yes, you're right. Those are the two funds that we've announced. Um, mm. But the, if you look at the missions that I just shared with you, um, we are going to break it down to the two funds um, in form of grants, matching grants, in terms of supporting for financing. But more importantly, we also want to ensure that Uh, as you mentioned uh, earlier, it's the right kind of investments that yes. we want to attract. Uh, so there are five key sectors that we are looking at that have, uh, you know, tick many of the boxes. Which uh, is my next question, Togo Zafro. Mm. Why these five sectors? I yeah. mean, some of them seem obscure to me. Mm. For example, pharmaceutical. Uh, that mm. That's one that kind of like, are we... Um, Do we have a big role to play? Yes, I yes, mean, yes. Uh, is this the right sector to be in? Aeronauticals is another one. Mm. So how were they chosen? What's yeah. the justification? Uh, well, of course, uh, Ken Ming is the best person to answer that because that five sector was done during his time. <laughs> <laughs> so he's blaming you. No, start, he's blaming start, you. Start, start, started during, uh, during my time, but uh, it was announced when uh, uh, Azmin Ali was the minister. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Yeah. trying to get him into the conversation. <laughs> but, the <laughs> but actually... Um, You'll be surprised, uh, even in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, Malaysia plays a major role uh, in that sector. And pharmaceutical uh, industry includes medical devices, like mm. in, the, in this case. And yes. again, the ENE sector is huge uh, for Malaysia. Very uh, high value added. It's very high value added. But uh, our big pharmaceutical company is a PN17 company. So you uh, would imagine that they would be spearheading mm. it. So it's not them. Is you going to have new pharmaceutical companies? Yes. Uh, we're talking about the whole ecosystem. The, mm. the, the, um, I mean, you, I think you're talking about one particular company. But if you look at the many of the world um, uh, leaders uh, in pharmaceuticals, including medical devices, are here uh, in Malaysia. In fact, many are in Penang. Uh, yeah. And also uh, uh, players from um, India, they are here they as well. Here, yeah, mm-hmm. also in Johor and mm-hmm. etc. Um, so it, it, it's a major contribution, uh, contributed to GDP uh, as well, and exports. Uh, in fact, if you know about exports, uh, 80% of Malaysia's exports are from the manufacturing sector. Okay, yeah. yes, yes. So and, and contribution to the uh, to the trade surplus is uh, very key. It's, it's very key, very key. We have enjoyed 40 months consecutive months of trade supplies touch wood that continues Mm. but Kenming do you think that uh, although he says it's your fault (laughs) that these five specific sectors these priority sectors make sense to you Uh, Uh, would you have liked any changes Uh, I think these are the high value added sectors that we uh, need to focus on in terms Mm. of uh, moving the envelope but I also say that you know for places like Sabah, Sarawak some of the less developed uh, areas in the east coast uh, there may be uh, room for Uh, other kinds of uh, sectors to be involved there as well. Maybe not as high value added, uh, but also uh, you know important in terms of uh, one of the missions with regards to inclusivity and also making uh, sure that there's regional parity in the distribution of investments. Yeah. Uh, just, just quickly on the NIMP funding, I think what uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, usually would do is they would negotiate with MIDA and MITI yeah. after the budget is after out. Budget, yeah. And then they also want to see that these funds are properly deployed Once there's a comfort level there, uh, hopefully the following years the amount can be increased. I would love to be a fly on that wall and find out how testy or feisty those conversations are. <laughs> But yes, I yes, want yes. to know, gentlemen, let's focus on a specific announcement at Budget 2024. That is, MITI and the promotion agency MIDA, they've oh. been tasked with easing the process of foreign and direct domestic direct investment from the application process 
to the realization of the investment. So a trade and investment coordination action committee has been set up, reports to the NIC chat by the PM. Is this a sign to you know, it's a sign to me that the current process is probably not as business friendly as it should be, right? Mm. What are the roadblocks here, Tunku Zofro? Yeah. Well, if you know, in my previous life, uh, previous life uh, in the corporate world, we when we look at uh, we look at how improving uh, efficiency, productivity, we also look at a customer, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a it's cus- the it's whole a customer experience. Customer that counts, experience, right? you know, is a, and then we look at their journey, right? Mm. So in here we look at the investor's journey. Uh, what are the pain points, right? Uh, in fact, we work with Ben and Gara on this, and they uh, together we see there's about fourteen pain points that we need to address, right? Um, and of course, hopefully, once we address them, we can address more. Um, going forward but these are the low hanging fruits um, and one of it is actually you know we have many IPAs uh, we need to streamline yes. uh, and 30 uh, over in 30 this country 30 over in the country correct uh, and Prime Minister is very very uh, uh, you know uh, well, he's very firm on this, uh, mm. that he wants to see this uh, streamline, right? Uh, and the National Investment Council, uh, that was the first agenda that he, he, we talked about. Uh, and he's in the process uh, now. Uh, Ken Ming is also on... on I, I'll be <laughs> attending my first mind about meeting on, uh, on So I'm Thursday. counting on him too. So, to, to <laughs> are we going to see some close down? I mean, some uh, or uh, uh, at least like amalgamated because it doesn't make sense to have 30 and... If we are going to be fiscally responsible, mm. this I, I is think a it's cost, a process. cost think, center, yeah, right? I think it's a process that Maida will take the lead on uh, in consultation mm. with the other agencies and also Miti and yes. hopefully... Uh, you know, a roadmap can be uh, can be devised yeah. relatively yeah. soon. But we, you mentioned ITAC just now. I mean, investment, uh, uh, t- t- uh, what do you call it? Trade uh, action, uh, coordination, coordination, action. coordination yeah. uh, committee. So that uh, we just had our first meeting yesterday. You know, PM announced on Friday. We had a meeting on yesterday, and Prime Minister also now have decided that the NIC, which is the National Investment Council, chaired by himself, will be done on a monthly uh, basis. Uh, so this will put uh, a lot of attention into execution um, because. Uh, the execution is not just at the federal level. I think that's one thing we, we I think you understand. Yeah. It goes down all state the way to the level, local council, yeah. yes. you know, from state to local council. Mm-hmm. So this, I think, is important. And you know, uh, yeah, last week, for example, uh, in in Perak, you know, we got the chief minister and the state ec- state uh, government officials also involved. Mm. Uh, and yesterday at the ITEC meeting, uh, the uh, state officials were also there. And I see that I think uh, the determination and the commitment uh, is showing. Um, so mm. that's important. Yeah, so quick, 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 quickly, mm. since you were f- uh, former Minister of Finance, one of the pain points that many investors face is getting the approval, necessary <laughs> approval for the tax incentives on the part of MOF. So what, what, what do you think can be done, you know, to, mm. um, to expedite or make this process more friendly towards uh, investors? Yeah, yeah, well, now I'm on this side, the first thing I, sh- <laughs> I should have done was to increase the budget of MIT. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Uh, yes, I think we need... To, of course, MOF is on the ITEC uh, in, yeah. uh, in, uh, in the committee and I hope... Uh, a lot of the pain points at the government side also can be addressed. Yeah. Okay, in mm. the minute or so that we have left, I have to mm. ask you, Tunku Zafro, mm. what role does NIMP help, uh, have in helping our SMEs? Yes. What, is, what, is it, what is it in for them? Because when we talk to them, yeah. they have a lot of issues. Yes. Labour, yes. talent, funding. What's the priority on NIMP? Yeah, in fact, yesterday, MID have just organised an NIMP conference with many of the SME players. And you're right, um, you know, SME, especially the mid-tier companies, uh, are feeling that uh, more attention is needed. Uh, and I think NIMP is focusing a lot uh, mm. on the SME and some of the funds are uh, primarily going uh, to the SME in the right sectors. So to me, uh, SME is key, um, you know, there's a lot of upside there. You know, SME in terms of exports only contributing 8%. Uh, GDP is only 38%. Uh, uh, so there are many uh, things okay. that we can do. Just 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, industry, uh, in, uh, industry ESG framework that was announced by MITI as well. This part of the NIMP and hopefully it will help the SMEs uh, increase their exposure to ESG reporting. The issue with them mm. is actually sometimes access to funding, whether it's too bureaucratic, but we can discuss that later. Because of full time for politics, you didn't think that I wouldn't be asking some <laughs> questions. So really, this the hot seat begins now. Mm. First off, has AMNO as a party lost mm. its way? Not just in terms of its values, but as a political party of choice among Malaysians, because that's what the general and recent state elections tell us. Mm, thank you. Uh, thank you for the political question. I thought it was going to be about budget and IMP. <laughs> uh, but of course, as a party man, I think uh, there are challenges uh, mm. in, in, uh, within the party uh, and about, uh, you know, about Malaysians in general think about the party. Uh, but to me, uh, the recent two by-elections shows that, you know, we are still relevant. Um, we are, of But course, those were safe seats, right? 
Uh, I don't think any seats are safe today, um, to be fair. Uh, and you've seen it also from the state elections, right? Where many, th- many seats we thought was safe uh, was not safe. But um, at the end of the day, I think what we need to focus on uh, as we uh, rebuild uh, the strength of, of the party is to look at deliverables um, that we are want to, to achieve, right? Mm. Um, so let's focus on that. Um, for me, uh, in my what role... What are those deliverables, though, then, for you? Um, well, for me, as, as, as the Minister of MITI, uh, we must make sure that whatever we want to uh, or do uh, mm. uh, is executed well. Um, I think investment and trade is key component of GDP uh, and energy of growth. Um, you know, uh, and at the end of the day, we need to convince uh, the people that uh, the policies uh, that are being formulated has will be executed. Okay, uh, but what as a as a party, what needs to change, Doctor yeah. Tunku Zafo? Does that change include uh, any yeah. changes at the top? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because. Uh. There are voices, right, asking mm. for a change. Yeah. And those voices seem to be getting louder, sometimes softer, but generally it still exists. Uh, well, in politics, voices, there are always two sides uh, mm. uh, to, to any um, um, views. Uh, there's only two sides to any opinions, yes. right? Uh, to me, uh, what's important is that we consolidate, uh, we look at uh, uh, less talk about politics, but more on execution, on the outcome uh, of what we think is good uh, for the people. So to me, uh, let's move on. Uh, so your loyalties lie with the current president? My loyalty Dato right. Sri Zahid Hamidi, yes, you do not want to change in no, the president. No, I think what's important is my loyalty is to the party. I'm a party okay. man, just like our president is also a party man. Um, and I think there is a, a, a process that we must uh, respect uh, to hold the party line. Um, and But I must say that uh, you are correct. Um, there are there's a long way to go. Uh, yeah. We need to rebuild uh, the party, and I, I'm I'm you know as part of the Supreme Council member, and I, I have a role to play, and I would like to make sure that um, we continue to be relevant uh, in the future. Would you have uh, run in a state seat in Selangor if you were offered it during the state elections? If I was offered, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's say there's a there's a seat that comes up. Mm. Right. Is that something you'll be gunning for then? Be it at the state level or even at the federal <laughs> level? Well, again, you know, uh, in this parliamentary system, uh, it all depends on the party, right? Mm. Uh, it's a party that I don't uh, contest. Uh, I will not ever contest as an independent. Um, mm. So therefore, it really is a party decision uh, to, 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 to make. And they have to, they have to decide. Um, but for me, uh, you know, as a politician, <laughs> I'm more than ever uh, willing to, uh, to contribute in any way I can. Okay, yeah. I need to come back mm. to Amno and how it's mm. intending to change its fortunes. That one question for Ken. Or? For you, oh, for, for me, you, I thought you wanted the third. No, no. Because if you look at it, especially with the Malay voters, mm. Perikata National seems to be their party of choice. Mm. How do you gain back the trust and be their party of choice again? Yes. You know, is internal reform possible? The mm. easiest way would be to have a new leader, perhaps. So, <laughs> what really then are your plans, Tunku Zafro? Or yes. what is Amno's plans? Yes. I think people uh, don't look solely on uh, leadership of any organisation or party. They don't? Uh, no, that I think... In Malaysia, we are very much driven by the leader, by the party, less so by the candidate, what the candidate stands for. No, I think uh, more and more uh, people look at what uh, the party stands for uh, as well, right? Okay. Uh, and if the party stands for what they believe in, uh, and but at the same time, do what they, they say they're going to do, uh, that will make uh, a difference. Uh, to, to me, like I said earlier, uh, what's important uh, is uh, for AMNO uh, to show uh, to, uh, to the voters out there uh, that we are here uh, to support. We are a moderate party, right? Um, and um, we want to work uh, with all uh, Malaysians. And we've mm. shown, uh, you know, I, th- I must say my colleagues uh, in VPH, in, in, in the cabinet, and now most of the programs uh, we do together. Uh, you know, Sabah Sarawak as well. Sabah Sarawak as well. It's been uh, successful. And I think that's what, you know, that's why I, I'm, I'm here, right? Okay. I, I think uh, it is a party where uh, it's tolerant, uh, it's moderate, and I, uh, Malaysia needs uh, a party that can work uh, with all uh, races. But, but yeah. I will have to say, yeah. for mm. UMNO, it needs to bring back people like Sharia Hamdan, like Khairi Jamaluddin, back into the fold so that they can attract some of the younger voters. Uh, Is that something that you would be open to? I mean, uh, you, mm. you know... Tukuzafro? Well, both of them are my friends and Kemming knows that. Mm. Um, and, you know, um, and I think 
I'm not need good people. Yes, okay. right. Yeah. But you didn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, do you agree that you that Amno should bring back your ex president Datuk Sri Najib Razak? I mean, it mm. seems like there are calls for him to be released, to be pardoned. Do you agree yeah. with that? I mean, he does stand for a period of time in Malaysia that was very dark, you know, mm. for his corruption, the one MDB. Is it not right for Amno to move away from that era? To be associated with the era, why does the party still hang on to that? Yes, uh, well, to me, um, I think we, 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 I'm very uh, objective uh, about this. Uh, mm. I think we lo- talk to the party members. Uh, you can't deny the fact uh, that Datuk Sri Najib uh, really has helped a lot uh, to the for the party. Um, and you know, there are views, uh, you know, different views, uh, public and, and the party itself. Uh, but for me, again, uh, you know, we should move forward um, and look at. Because pe- this is the, the one MDB issue, etc. Uh, yes, uh, at that time uh, it was a major uh, issue. Uh, yes. You know, I mean, I know I was from the private sector at the time, uh, but going forward, I think people they need to move away, uh, move forward, and focus on Malaysia. Because today, uh, it, the world out there is not looking at Malaysia uh, alone. Uh, looking at all our uh, neighbors. Uh, Well, what's happening globally is going to affect Malaysia. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but we, sadly we can't run away from politics. And I just want to <laughs> ask you, uh, you know, your your second term as senator is uh, running out. Uh, yes. And uh, it'll run out in November 2025. Oh, Jeremy grilling me more than you. <laughs> I was coming to that. I was coming to that. You're not going to get off easily. Yeah. So w- 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 what are your plans after that? You know. You yeah. Ask. <laughs> well, you're right. Uh, this is my second term uh, as a senator. So it ends end of uh, November. And 20- you can't run the Kabian senator again, right? You know. Uh, based on the constitution, I yes. only have two terms, um, uh, so you know there will be a gap uh, if I have, have given the opportunity to uh, to take part in the next general election. Twenty twenty six. That's about a year plus uh, gap, right? Uh, mm. I might join Kiaming then. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, you no, very welcome no, to Taylor's uh, University. Uh, to I can be his research assistant, <laughs> but I have no plans yet. Honestly, I have not thought about what's going to happen uh, in that because right now, as it is, it's so busy uh, mm. uh, today. But, uh, but I have to th- start thinking about it closer to the date, lah. Like, what I about have, your um, plans within Amno? Where mm. do you see yourself? Because now you are a member of the Supreme Council. What are your ambitions within that? And even then, we were we are always a bit confused when you actually really join Amno, mm. which is something we asked you on this show many years ago. Mm. Yes, then we were a bit of surprise oh he's an amno member yeah well as you know i was an amno member i am an amno member at that time i was not an active uh, amno member uh, because uh, many uh, members are also not as active and after that when i joined the bank especially at a senior level i can't be active uh, it's not allowed and when i became the group ceo zero there's no way mm. right uh, so that's why I, and i actually Very honest with you, and Kiaming knows this. I was not interested in politics. Like I mean, I know Kiaming when I was as a banker. I was looking at uh, really focusing on my career. And now, uh, and now it's different. I, I must say, you know, that, that's why I, I never, Arno? never say never uh, in a, a lot VP, of things. Uh, maybe it's yeah. called the political bug. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't But know how Kiaming got out of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like the the next thing the, to be a vice president. Madam, no, look at the. T- President, <laughs> well, we'll take one step at a time. Uh, But you're not close to the idea. I'm not really thought about it uh, because I've just become a super council member in the last I don't know uh, election uh, this year, right? Mm. Um, but to me, again, I will you know what like to play uh, in a role where I can contribute. Right. So, mm. so you mentioned you're very busy, mm. but that didn't prevent you from uh, <laughs> taking the position of uh, the new president of the Badminton Association mm. of Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. I personally was hoping that you may, <laughs> yeah, I was hoping that you would take over the position of the president of the Malaysian Athletics Federation. But you know, why, why, why yeah. uh, BAM and uh, why, what are your plans and goals? In terms of mm. maybe perhaps even bringing back our first gold medal at the Olympic Games in Paris. <laughs> well, I didn't know you at the time, honestly, to go to I mean, and I didn't even know you play badminton. Everyone yeah. knows you run and cycle, but yeah, badminton, yeah. really? Yes, I do play badminton. In fact, I played badminton for school before, and uh, I can't wait to play badminton with you. Because uh, uh-huh. uh, he showed me a clip. His, uh, his uh, <laughs> smash is pretty good. Yeah. So okay, are you going to promise us our first gold Olympic gold in Paris 2024? Then we we'll hear about you know making sure you're on the straight and narrow. Uh, well, first of all, uh, with the answer to Kami's question, um, well, I'm uh, I'm humbled and honoured uh, by the uh, the decision by BAM, uh, BAM uh, Council, and I'm looking forward to meet them. Uh, mm. I think it's unfair for me to make any uh, statements yet until.
still I meet them and hear hear them out. Uh, but I hear uh, you know, your your <laughs> your target is a gold medal. But let's see. Um, uh, it, it I think sports brings people together, right? Um, and you know, apart from FEM football, badminton I think is also a key uh, sport that will bring people to it. And I want to see that uh, happening here uh, in Malaysia. Put you on the spot. Mm. Who are your favorite Malaysian badminton players now? Uh, still the old players. Natalie. <laughs> 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 <Literally. laughs> <laughs> on that note, thank you for your time, gentlemen. Joining me on the breakfast grill this morning was Minister and also previous Deputy Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, Tunku Datuk Zafro Aziz, and on Ken Ming. I'm Wong Shaoning, BFM eighty nine point nine.